as The Money Burns is an original podcast by Nikki Woodard. Based on historical research, this is a deep exploration into what happened to a set of actual heirs and heiresses to some of America's most famous fortunes when the Great Depression hits. Each episode has three primary sections. Section 1 is an heir to story. Section 2 goes deeper into the historical facts. Section 3 focuses on contemporary, emotional, and personal connections. Story Recap The Lindbergh baby kidnapping is the crime of the century, and Evelyn Walsh McLean is determined to help solve it. Now back to As the Money Burns. Wild Goose Chase The owner of a famous cursed jewel goes on a wild goose chase to save a kidnapped baby. But will she become another victim? Section 1. Story. Day 1, 2, 3, 9, 12, 17, 20, and counting. The world still doesn't know the answer to the most pressing question. Where is Charles Lindbergh Jr.? The toddler was kidnapped from his bedroom on March 1, 1932. A ransom note was left behind. Speculations, leads, the press? Everyone is riveted. Even Al Capone has offered his help. From her house at Fairview outside Washington, D.C., Evelyn Wash McLean waits by the phone waiting for more information. She caresses her priceless Hope Diamond, each night ending in disappointment, only to be revitalized with hope at sunrise. Days after the kidnapping, she hands 100000 that's $2.18 million in 2023, to Gaston Means, a former FBI agent with ties to the underworld, who is offered to serve as a liaison for the Lindberghs. The anxiety of the nation is at a high. Multiple kidnappings have spread out and are a rising threat. Formerly a crime very few needed to fear, the elite have had to ramp up security measures. Teen heiresses Doris Duke and Barbara Hutton not only have governess chaperones, but now bodyguards travel with them everywhere. Kind of a damper on young ladies hoping to find love and romance. By the end of March 1932, Evelyn meets up with Gaston once again. She gives him an additional 4000 for expenses, about 88000 in 2023. They agree to meet soon down near her house in Aiken, South Carolina. There she will receive the baby. More waiting, more agony. Could they be watching her? Could she become a target too? A doctor friend gives her a special fountain pen filled with poison instead of ink. A small, innocuous-looking device in case anyone tries to force her to write something against her will. Each night, Evelyn struggles to sleep. During a violent dream, she thrashes about until jolting awake. Drenched in sweat, she tries to calm herself confused and muddled. A wind howls outside and thrashes a window shutter. She jumps again, grabbing the special fountain pen from her bedstand. She clutches it with her life. If anyone was coming for her, she could stab them, injecting the poison like a cobra's fang. A distant railroad whistle shocks her back into focus. What mess has she gotten herself into? How far would this venture take her to the edge? Gaston finally reaches out again and informs Evelyn that the criminals would be willing to deal with her in El Paso, Texas. Evelyn packs her bags and makes the arrangement to travel with her nurse and a maid. She checks into the hotel under the name of Mrs. Lane. Evelyn makes sure to always remain in sight of her female companions, the hair on her neck standing on end, always alert, always concerned. Likely, the kidnappers would deliver the baby, then quickly escape capture, crossing the border into Mexico. After another consultation, Evelyn nods in agreement to the plan. Gaston disappears for a few hours. The evening buzzes from the sound of locusts. Or could it be? Rattlesnake tails. The sound of looming, unknown danger. Thinking to herself, she begins to grow suspicious of Gaston. When he returns, there is no baby. 
Instead, he says now the kidnappers would turn the baby over in Mexico. Evelyn's stomach tightens, almost causing her to fall over. She steals herself. Her skin feels flush. If she goes into Mexico, she might never come back. After Gaston leaves, Evelyn hurriedly leaves for Washington, D.C. She leaves behind her nurse on the off chance the baby does appear. However, she herself is in mortal danger. Back in D.C., she recruits the Roman Catholic priest, Father Herney, to demand Gaston repay her money. Herney was earlier part of the plan to be the actual recipient of the baby. Meanwhile, Charles Lindbergh, in his own efforts, has two other failed recovery attempts. More days go by, more headlines, more false leads. A baby's life on the line. Will the agony ever end? Or is it better to hold on to hope? A limbo dance with hell. Section 2, History and Historiography In retelling this angle of the Lindbergh kidnapping, I find myself wondering about so many questions. Of course I've read and heard about the Lindbergh kidnapping in the past, but I must admit I am nowhere near any sort of even amateur expert. It is only in retreading the story now that I'm learning most of the details which I am pointing out. I only knew the highlights of the case, and even those didn't stick precisely in my head. The Lindbergh home in Hopewell, New Jersey quickly became a command post and dormitory. Several close confidants and those aiding in the investigation would stay there and consult on facts. Meanwhile, ransom notes continued to arrive to the Lindberghs and several of their associates. While Evelyn Wash McLean chases the leads by Gaston Means, Charles Lindbergh is embroiled in several of his own. The madness continues as everyone keeps chiming in. Plenty of intermediaries, go-betweens, and the subsequent wild goose chases. Lindbergh pushes away law enforcement aid in several of the solo independent recovery attempts while also manning his own flying expeditions over suspected areas. The worried and again pregnant Anne Lindbergh finds herself thoroughly depressed and defeated amidst the chaos. It's a convoluted overlapping timeline of events, rarely if ever told in a straightforward fashion. Various retellings might mention these adjoining recovery attempts or failures, but like other stories I am telling when told in large traditional fashion, these smaller ones get further pared down or even overlooked depending on the angle of the retelling. There is a lot of overlap and quite a bit of confusion amongst the sources, so I'm not sure how to vet their accuracy as has proven problematic for previous, less serious subject matters. Some of the books are even skeptical of the crime and have alternate theories. However, those are great in that they help highlight these other side tales as proof for their skepticism. Hence, I'm going to try to stick more with individuals than dates. But what I'm explaining all happens within a six-week time period just after the kidnapping on March 1st, 1932. These are just the larger situations as there is a flood of speculation and attempts coming from everywhere. First up, underground associate Morris Mickey Rossner is contacted to aid in the investigation. Rosner is under prosecution for a different charge when his lawyer, Robert Thayer, asks about Rosner's previous offer for information to aid in any kidnapping as a way to help with any plea deals. Thayer himself has marital ties to the Standard Oil fortune via his wife and her mother. Quickly, Rosner receives $2,500 to use in payoffs to informants. Rosner assists in getting Limber connected to two other mobsters. March 6, 1932, Lindbergh releases a press announcement that known criminal gangster kingpin Salvatore Salvi Spitali and his lieutenant Irving Bitz are designated underground liaisons. Since the announcement, Spitali receives hundreds of leads and thinks one might be very productive. He will check it out after settling another matter. A week later, Spitali and Bitz will be hauled into New York courts on a prohibition-related charge. 
As well, Spitale ups the security around his own two children, who are now receiving kidnapping threats. Three letters, though likely cranks, safety becomes a primary concern. On March 6, 1932, a new ransom letter arrives at the Lindbergh home. It was postmarked on March 4th from Brooklyn. The new ransom amount requested is for $70,000, or $1.5 million, in 2023, up from the initial $50,000, or roughly $1 million, in 2023. A third ransom note, also postmarked from Brooklyn, is sent to Wall Street lawyer and former military Colonel Henry Skillman Breckenridge. Breckenridge is essentially Lindbergh's right hand in much of his home-based operations relating to this crime. This third note indicates that John Condon should be the intermediary for the kidnappers. On March 8, 1932, well-known Bronx personality, American football coach, and retired teacher principal, 72-year-old John Francis Condon offers in a local newspaper, Bronx Home News, an additional $1,000 on top of the Lindbergh reward if kidnappers confess or turn the child over to a priest. Immediately by the next day, he receives 20 letters about the crime at his home. Three are suspected to might actually be from the kidnappers. The grammar and spelling are horrible. Condon even receives a few phone calls with the supposed kidnapper, who has a thick German or Scandinavian accent. Condon heads over to consult with Lindbergh, and he's even allowed to stay in the baby's nursery. With Lindbergh's approval, Condon takes a few items from the room, including wooden animal toys to help identify the child. Lindbergh and Condon agree to use the codename JAFC, a play on Condon's initials, JFC. This will be used in coded messages sent to the kidnappers via another local newspaper, New York American. One such note, March 11, 1932, I accept. Money is ready. JAFC. That night, responding to another message and direction, Condon goes to the Woodlawn Cemetery and meets with a figure referred as Cemetery John, who between harsh hacking costs, agrees to get more proof of association to the baby. All the while, others speculate. From his Cook County jail cell, Al Capone proposes the theory that it had to be mob-related, because otherwise, the kidnappers would have been caught by now. He still offers to help and is willing to pay a $200,000 bond, that's $4.4 million in 2023, if he is temporarily released to interview his contacts. Police focus on trying to locate Henry Red Johnson, an associate of the Scottish nurse Betty Gow. Johnson is considered a suspect as he drove Gow to Hopewell the day of the kidnapping. He works on boats and is not in the area for questioning, further adding to suspicion. Another Lindbergh servant, Violet Sharp, is also under heavy interrogation as her whereabouts were unknown during the kidnapping. Meanwhile, newspapers go over and over the facts of the crime. Even the Royal Canadian Mounted Police launch a three-hour search of a houseboat following a valuable trail. One reported theory claims a mysterious Fred Short as a handwriting suspect. There is a hint that the kidnapping plot had been hatched over a year ago from Vancouver. On March 12, 1932, a man flags down a taxicab driver, Joseph Perrone, and gives him a note to be delivered to Condon with more instructions. In both March 13, 1932, in Bronx Home News, and March 14, 1932, New York American, Condon promptly releases the message, Money is ready. No cops. No secret service. No press. I come alone, like last time. On March 16, 1932, Condon receives in the mail a baby's Dr. Denton No. 2 sleeping suit, along with a seventh ransom note. Lindbergh confirms that the clothing item belongs to his son. April 1, 1932, Condon receives a letter saying it is time for the ransom to be delivered. That same day, on a walk to feed guards on the Lindbergh Hopewell estate, Nurse Betty Gow and another servant, Elsie Watley, find among the gravel one of the metal thumb guards Charles Lindbergh Jr. had been wearing the night of his kidnapping. The despair of that discovery further heats up efforts. On April 2, 1932, an unknown taxi cab driver shows up serving as an intermediary and delivers to Condon another note for a meeting that night. 
Lindbergh dresses in disguise as a hunter and joins the party, but does not directly meet Cemetery John. At this next meeting with Cemetery John, Condon states only 50000 has been raised, and John said it was acceptable, then hands over a note, informing him the child was with two innocent women. Condon then hands over the ransom, placed in a custom wood box with some gold certificates, in hopes of identifying them later. Also, the regular bills are not marked, but the serial numbers have been written down. Only thousands of bills and busy bank tailors are unable to process and check while handling regular customer demands. Many bills are found in circulation even as far as Chicago and Minneapolis, but still no traceable links as hoped. The gold certificates more distinct and soon to be out of circulation are the biggest chance at capture. Upon Condon's return, Lindbergh rips open the note, ignoring the wait six hours order. The baby is in a boat called Nellie off the Massachusetts coast. Lindbergh launches a search by ground, sea, and air with no luck. By now, a third intermediary becomes the primary hope for recovery. Back in March 24, 1932, Lindbergh begins potential negotiations with Commodore John Hughes Curtis, a boat builder in Norfolk, Virginia. For three weeks, Curtis offers to help with two other noted citizens, Reverend Mr. H. Dobson Peake and Admiral Guy Barrage. Admiral Barrage had been in command of the U.S. warship that brought Lindbergh and his plane, the Spirit of St. Louis, back to America after his historic 1927 flight. Upon first news of the crime, Curtis is informed by local Norfolk bootlegger Sam that the kidnappers might be holding the baby on a boat in nearby Cape May, New Jersey. Curtis describes the ransom notes along with other details. Curtis also leaks the information that the kidnapping plot originated within the Lindbergh household among the servants along with details on the house. This latter bit of information makes Lindbergh more agitated and suspicious about his own personal staff. On April 18, 1932, in a conference with Lindbergh and New Jersey Police Superintendent Norman Schwarzkopf, John Hughes Curtis relays a meeting with his confidant Sam, the actual cemetery John, and four others of various nationalities in the kidnapping gang. Curtis negotiates a ransom of 100000 Another potential rabbit hole. One reporter for Hearst New York Journal, Laura Vitre, follows the case closely, especially the Condon Jassy announcements, then the John Hughes Curtis Dash Sam rumors. Convinced of a conspiracy, she writes her own book with theories on the crime and prophesizes the child's return alive if they follow her recommendations. She publishes her book, The Great Lindbergh Hullabaloo on April 12, 1932. Among all these attempts, the Lindberghs themselves pay two different ransoms with no results. Extortion at its finest. As the story gets more convoluted and entwined, the only thing that really matters is that there is hope that the baby is still alive. It could only be a matter of time, and with the right negotiations, that the child will be returned. A deep, insecure hope. Section 3, Contemporary and Personal Relevance. True crime is one of the most popular genres in books, documentaries, websites, podcasts, and whatever new media will come in the future. Many, especially women, are riveted by tales of crime. But there is a special attraction for those unsolved. The internet has opened up more possibilities for cyber sleuths to review potential clues and try to outguess law enforcement efforts. While many are well-meaning, they are often wrong and can actually impede an investigation. Worse, they can spawn off more complicated campaigns in accusing the innocent, tarnishing a person's reputation with no apology or correction afterwards. One more recent example is the 2013 tale of a missing Canadian tourist of Hong Kong descent, Elisa Lam, 
at the Cecil Hotel in Los Angeles. She is found days later naked in the water tank on the hotel's roof. The mysteriousness of her death and the last security camera footage of her alive in an elevator spark many imaginations, spawning horror films, songs, and music videos. In 2021, Netflix features the story in the documentary crime scene, The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel. The story takes a bizarre twist as cyber sleuths obsess over the elevator footage of Lam and come up with fantastical theories on her disappearance. And unhappy with the results from the actual investigation, which had the more simple explanation of a psychotic break after under-medicating her bipolar disorder, accidental drowning, and hypothermia. Later in August 2021, another recent case caught attention when Instagrammer Gabby Petito went missing during a trip with her boyfriend and fiancé, Brian Laundrie. Her body was discovered in September 2021, and viral attention focused on the case while trying to track down the then-missing Laundrie. Laundrie's remains would be found in October 2021, and with him a notebook in which he confesses to her murder and his suicidal plans. Sometimes groups form in discussing and trying to solve crimes. One group via Reddit went into overdrive trying to identify the 2013 Boston Marathon bomber, accusing several innocent individuals while devolving into an online witch hunt. WebSleuths.com is one online community where members work with law enforcement in helping solve crimes. With over 185,000 members, there are strict guidelines forbidding rumors but helping collect concrete evidence, such as where a shirt might have been made, bank records, and other items that might aid in solving a case. The biggest win was solving the 2009 death of former homeless guy turned lottery winner Abraham Lee Shakespeare, who was killed by his business manager, Doris Didi Moore, who was also a member of the online club to deflect suspicion. Another member found Didi's bank records, which led to her arrest. Without a doubt, crimes will always exist, and with that, there will always be those more willing to jump into action and try to solve them. Only too bad such aid isn't so readily available when it comes to crimes of the heart. For those, our heirs and heiresses need more preventative means of protection. Curious to find another true crime podcast? Then you might want to check out Ye Old Crime Podcast by Lindsay Valenti and Madison Stongle. They cover tales from yesteryear pre-1900, and it is not always murder. Here's their trailer. Do you love true crime, but are looking for something different? Do you like learning about cases so off the wall they can't possibly be true? Do you love history, but want to hear about what they didn't teach you in school? Do you like laughing awkwardly about cases that are bizarre and a little strange? Then we have the podcast for you. Join me, Lindsay. And me, Madison, for Yield Crime. Where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. Listen every Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime. Recent episodes include Pirate Queen, Grace of Mali, the Dahomey Amazons, and the Pendle Witches with a Dangerous Family Feud, among other interesting tales. Links available in the notes section and transcript. If you enjoy As the Money Burns, then please share, like, and subscribe. Next, when we return to As the Money Burns, a large public spectacle features an heiress at its center. But all that attention comes with other warnings. Until then. As the Money Burns is an original podcast written, produced, and voiced by Nikki Woodard based on historical research. Archival music has been provided by Past Perfect Vintage Music. Check out their website at www.pastperfect.com. Please come visit us at As the Money Burns via Good Pods, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Transcripts, timeline, episode guide, and character bios are available at asthemoneyburns.com.